Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, being here. It's a great honor uh, to be among all the great leadership of this city and the state. Uh, I'm going to talk today uh, and really build upon the comments of uh, particularly Mayor Landrieu in terms of what it means to reinvest in our cities uh, in terms of how we got here. Uh, as well as what our cities could mean for our future. And the idea that our cities are not simply a, uh, a moral obligation to invest in, but that if we make the right investments in our cities, that that is the path towards uh, a better economy, a better environment, and more social mobility actually for our entire country. Uh, so I'm going to begin by sort of giving you some context about where we sit in this country today. We still, from the Great Recession, have some 11 million Americans underwater, meaning that their debt is greater than their assets are worth, particularly their homes, um, and that we today uh, have a rate of land use in this country where we basically use land at twice our, twice our population growth. Our houses are actually growing in size, even though our family sizes are shrinking. Uh, and I attribute this directly to the density at which Americans live. Today, uh, the, most Americans live in single-family homes. Only about 4% of Americans live at what we planners call 30 units per acre, which is the density, that little green slice of pie on the chart, which is the density that you need to support public mass transportation, meaning a light rail system, subway system, uh, and so forth. And what's interesting is this is not actually a, 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 a historic phenomenon in the country. If you look from 1910, and Mayor Landry was talking about this a little bit uh, earlier this morning, we actually lived at that density throughout this country. If you look at Detroit, which is the third row over there, right, uh, that it, we actually had a very, very dense city at the beginning of uh, the 1900s, and we have systematically spread out our cities into what we affectionately call sprawl. Um, and what I want to talk about here is not, you know, people should live how they want to live. If people want to live in the suburbs if they want a house and they want a, uh, a big lawn. That's completely up to them. But what I'm trying to examine is to what degree has the government intervened in those choices that people make? And it's rather extraordinary. So if you look at local planning and zoning, only about 12% of the zoned land in the United States is zoned densely enough to support mass transit. So we're creating a landscape that's reliant on cars. Um, if you look at how much money we put into roads versus mass transit, and this is always such an interesting conversation. Well, we always talk about, well, light rail systems or subways, they take so much public subsidy. But the fact is we spend four times as much on roads annually as we do any other form of transportation in the country. Uh, and then you look at the amount of money that the government puts into fossil fuels and actually uh, uh, kind of artificially lowering the cost of oil and gas, right, uh, in order to have a more drivable environment. Or you look at the biggest tax subsidy in the entire federal system, which is the mortgage interest deduction. Now, that's available for multifamily homes as well, but the vast majority of the users of the mortgage interest deduction are actually single family home buyers. Most of them are middle to upper middle class people. They don't think of it as a subsidy. We think of it as just a sort of God given right to be able to uh, deduct the interest on up to a $1.1 million home. Uh, and it is an enormous subsidy compared to what the government grants actually in terms of building affordable housing and especially urban affordable housing. Uh, what's interesting is people defend the, uh, that policy because they say if you didn't have it, well, you wouldn't have a housing market. The only problem is the data do not support that assertion. Uh, if you look at other countries that have either uh, eliminated that uh, deduction or, uh, uh, or uh, never had it in the first place, you have the same rates of home ownership. Uh, so what's interesting is we came into this century actually instead of questioning all those government subsidies in the marketplace, actually doubling down on the idea, right, of creating this thing that President Bush called the Ownership Society, uh, and where, uh, where Fannie and Freddie were sort of discharged to create subprime mortgages and actually sort of prime the pump. Um, and what that did is that by 2009, the amount of mortgage debt uh, particularly on single-family homes in this country, reached almost 80% of our GDP, uh, an extraordinary level of debt until we started deleveraging after the Great Recession. Uh, 
and what and people, you know, if I talk about these things, people say, well, I'm attacking the American dream. I actually don't believe that's what the American dream is. I believe what I'm talking about is the American scheme. And the American scheme is centered on the idea of consumption, that we buy bigger homes, we buy bigger cars, we buy bigger TV screens that don't fit in our bigger cars, so we then get a bigger home and a bigger car and a bigger garage. Uh, until what happens is that over time, that prosperity for future generations starts to decrease, and that's precisely what's happening with our millennial generation today. They are losing prosperity over time because of the amount of debt we've poured into the system because of our consumptive habits. Um, what's interesting is if you look at the history of the American dream, there's never a mention of a single family house or a car, but actually this idea that America is a place that you come for opportunity. Uh, and that regardless of birth or religion or social status, that you can actually find opportunity and that over time, that parents work hard, they send their kids to school and their kids are more prosperous than they were or their grandparents were. That to me, this is the sort of fundamental foundation of the American dream and certainly true of my own family who came to this country with $32 in the 1960s. Um, so, I used to work for Mayor Bloomberg, and he had a, a great Michigander as his deputy mayor, Dan Doktoroff. And Dan Doktoroff talked about this thing called the virtuous cycle of the successful city, which is precisely what Mayor Landrieu was talking about this morning. And the idea is simply this, that as cities grow and they uh, attract new residents, that attracts new tax dollars, which in turn allows that city to invest in quality of life, in better schools, better parks, better transit, and so forth. And what that does is, of course, it attracts new residents, which attracts new tax dollars. And so I think this question that's being debated here and across the country about, well, when a city has a tax base, how much of its tax base should it deploy towards its municipal workforce versus quality of life is a very, very serious decision. Because if you don't make the right quality of life investments, that tax base is going to erode over time and those municipal workers will ultimately be hurt. And so it's actually in their best interest to make sure that cities and mayors can budget towards towards quality of life expenditures. Uh, great urbanist Jane Jacobs talked about all of this as well, actually well before Dan's time, and she had a great theory called import replacement that talked about how cities grow. And her basic uh, formulation were that cities were the fountainhead of the wealth of nations, that actually er, national prosperity came from urban prosperity. And if you look at the data, she couldn't have been more right. Our research center at Columbia did this analysis using uh, quite, a bit of, uh, quite a number of data sets, and we found a staggering concentration of prosperity creation in our cities. Essentially, 90% of our GDP is generated on 3% of the land mass of the United States. 86% of US jobs are generated on 3% of the land mass of the United States. That is not at all to disrespect the rest of the country. It's not particularly to disrespect the agriculture that we need that happens outside of our cities. But the point is, is that if you look towards uh, how the country will get more prosperous, cities are clearly the answer. And what is fascinating is if you look at what cities produce, the city of Chicago, for instance, produces far more in terms of economic output annually than 42 of our states, including some of our biggest and most productive industrial states. So you would think that if you went to Chicago, you would ride on a world-class subway system, they would have the best schools in the country, uh, that they would have gleaming parks, which actually they built some gleaming parks, um, and yet, we don't find that. My own city of New York, we have a 100-year-old dilapidated subway system. Our school system is perennially in trouble. And so you have to ask why, if cities are generating so much wealth, how could it be that our urban infrastructure is so poor? And it's fairly simple. If you look at cities like Hong Kong or Singapore, which are fundamentally city-states, they get to generate the wealth that they create. They get to keep the wealth that they generate. What that means is, is they can invest in that great train that takes you from the airport into the heart of the city, into the great subway system, and so forth and so on. Um, as opposed to our cities, which generate a tremendous amount of wealth and ba basically through redistributive tax policy, give it out to the hinterlands and the rings and rings and rings of land around it. The other thing that's interesting is if you look at those two images, that's Los Angeles on the left, Hong Kong on the right, 
People think of Hong Kong and they think of, you know, a dense, horrible urban place. You know, many people have these stereotypes about Hong Kong. Two-thirds of Hong Kong is undeveloped country park and it's actually a city of hikers. So the density is very concentrated and you can leave your apartment and you can suddenly find yourself in wild nature very, very quickly. Uh, which leads to the, the sort of next question, which is of uh, sustainability. If I can get the slide to change. Or maybe not. Um, well, I'll try to do it with a finger pup with a shadow puppets then. Uh, basically, what uh, what the data shows is that if you look at the average carbon footprint of an urban dweller versus the average carbon footprint of the rest of the country, you'll find a dramatic reduction in how much energy we use per person because people live in smaller apartments which heat and cool each other. Every architect understands this. A single family home is a terrible thermal envelope. Um, and because we ride in mass transit. And so there's just this natural way. And in fact, the citizens of Hong Kong have, are, have some of the lowest energy use per capita of any city in the country, or excuse me, any country in the world. So if you look at this slide, what's interesting to me is we talk about green buildings a lot. I'm sure you've read about this, right? And so you take the average suburban home and you slap, say, solar panels and windmills and the electric car, which is actually an environmental disaster. I won't go into why here, uh, uh, versus just ordinary urban life. And you start to see that the carbon footprint per person goes down. And now if you apply green technology to denser urban buildings, which is something we're very focused on today, you can then really start addressing this issue of climate change. Uh, in addition, though, to the, the advantages in terms of economy and environment, you have to start convincing people, well, cities need to be attractive to people in terms of public health and public joy. You have to want to live there or raise, their ki raise your kids there, as I do with my own kids in New York City. And what's interesting is if you look at statistics like public health, what you find out is the further you get out from the city center, you start getting into issues like less walking that leads to chronic obesity and a bunch of other chronic diseases. Um, you find that, this is a Swedish study, this is my favorite, that absence does not make the heart grow fonder. And in fact, as commute times increase, your likelihood of divorce increases. Um, and this is something that our young people have caught on to. The millennial generation, the people born in the 80s and 90s, this is the largest demographic cohort in the history of the United States. It's 80 million people. Every survey shows that they would prefer to live in a denser, more walkable, urban environment as opposed to the sort of 20th century model of what happened uh, after World War II of the suburbs and, uh, and uh, cars. And if you think about it, why wouldn't they want to live that way? If you look at that top model, right, of driving from your home to your car, drinking and driving, road rage, uh, uh, driving while texting versus having a glass of wine after you go to after work, getting on a trolley or walking home, maybe meeting someone that you want to meet and saving time, which is the most precious commodity in a service economy after all. Uh, that this is something that our young people have absolutely caught on to. Um, and it means that we have to start investing in infrastructure in a different way. We have dropped our infrastructure investment. Um, and it means that we have to start thinking at a national level of things like high-speed rail. Detroit should be connected to the rest of the eastern seaboard and we should be able to take a train from Detroit to New York City and it would probably take about two hours downtown to downtown without having to get strip searched. Um, and we ran the train that China has today between Atlanta and New York. We could get downtown to Atlanta, downtown New York City in three hours. It would transform the national economy. At the local level, we have to start investing in things like an infrastructure of opportunity. What I mean by that is not just mass transit, but things like schools, parks, affordable housing. Uh, affordability is absolutely key. This is not the most pressing issue for Detroit. It's the most pressing issue for our very successful cities, Boston, San Francisco, DC, New York, where we have to invest much more in urban affordability. Uh, and one of the things that I talk about in my book is that if we start reversing some of these suburban subsidies, that look, again, people should live in the suburbs, but we shouldn't pay them to do it. We should take that money and invest it in the things that we need, including more urban affordability. 
Um, I won't go into detail, this is a diagram from the book that's called The Whole Enchilada, and basically it says if we took away all those subsidies, attributed half to the deficit and half to a new bill that I call the American Smart Infrastructure Act, or Asia for short, right, that if we took that money and invested it in our cities, that we could become more globally competitive and actually deal with a better economy, a better environment, and more social mobility. Um, and I'm going to very quickly talk about, this is an urban affordable housing model. I, I have about uh, a minute left, and I'm going to talk. Architecture extremely important because you have to convince people that you can live beautifully in the city uh, with new parks, uh, new cultural centers and facilities. This is just the last couple of slides. Um, we did the Barclays Center in downtown Brooklyn. Our firm designed that. Uh, it's transformed that part of the city. A huge number of millennials live near that. Uh, it's the only urban arena in the country that does not have a single parking space. Everyone comes by mass transit. Um, and we're looking at this at a larger level in terms of other projects we're doing in Brooklyn. And I think Brooklyn is very uh, tied to Detroit in terms of the history of what's happened in Brooklyn and what could happen in Detroit um, in terms of creating kind of this more walkable city, this city of uh, culture and diversity. Um, and I'll, I think my last slide is just the Great Hudson site, which our firm has been given the honor to design with uh, Dan Gilbert and Rock Ventures. And I can't talk very much about what's going to go there, but we see a tremendous obligation in terms of the future of Detroit and what this site could mean as a catalyst. So thank you very much for your attention. Please welcome the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of DTE Energy, Jerry Anderson. Speaker of the Michigan House of Representatives, Jace Bolger. President of Detroit City Council, Brenda Jones. President and Chief Executive Officer of the Kreisky Foundation, Rip Rapson and moderator Stephen Henderson, editorial page editor of the Detroit Free Press. So that was a really interesting uh, take on not just uh, what we face here in Detroit, but, uh, but what cities face all over. I, I want to start, though, with, uh, with Speaker Bolger. Uh, who I, I always I, get nervous when you start with me, Stephen. <laughs> That's, it's going to be okay. <laughs> We're friends today. <laughs> today, <all right. laughs> um, You know, I know that you have uh, recently taken an incredibly uh, poignant interest in the city. You've come and visited. You have started really talking about what role you feel like Lansing needs to play uh, in the city's future. Um, I want you to talk about what you are seeing and how is it uh, making you think differently, uh, perhaps, about that relationship. Well, I think it starts with uh, there are so many people who want to politicize or otherwise uh, talk about Detroit's problems and how that impacts the state. And I think the next logical conclusion is, well, then Detroit's successes will drive the state. And so I think that that should be clear for everyone, but I don't think it necessarily was. And that conversation hadn't percolated up. And so that, as we look at the settlement, as we look at the future of our state, it has to include a healthy Detroit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Councilwoman Jones, President uh, Jones, uh, you've also developed something of a relationship with the speaker uh, over, the, over the last uh, year or so, and uh, that's unusual, right? <laughs> it's new. You know, a lot of things are happening differently today. As we say, it's a new day, That's and it right. truly is a new day. And I went up to Lansing, and going up to Lansing, we realized that there are some great friends up in Lansing, and the speaker was one of the great friends that I met up in Lansing as I was up there. And there were many Republicans. You know, we have one Michigan, and we have one Detroit. And if Detroit is doing good, Michigan is doing good. And so our goal is to make sure that we all do good together. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of the speech that we just heard was about, I think, about investment and how we mm -hmm. uh, prioritize where we send resources, and not just in direct ways. I thought one of the more interesting points of it was the indirect ways that uh, our priorities uh, either either celebrate cities or undermine them. Uh, Rip, you guys have spent uh, at Kresge an awful lot of time and effort thinking about how that investment ought to, how that prioritization ought to look. 
uh, and how investment ought to track with that uh, in Detroit. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting, Stephen, from a foundation's perspective, you have only um, a limited amount of leverage, right? It, at some point, you can invest directly in something like a riverfront project or a, a rail project, and, and it helps sort of bring others to the dance. But in many ways, the, the most effective thing a foundation can do is essentially to signal to the market that there actually will be enduring value in a place. And so whether it's a, an arts and culture program, whether it's something like the rail project that sort of suggests that over time the land around the rail line will be more valuable and investable, or whether it's an investment in the Midtown Inc. Um, organization, those are the kinds of things that ultimately send a kind of signal to the folks who really have to come back to the table. I mean, it's people like Jerry and, and other folks from the private sector who at the end of the day are gonna have to be comfortable that this is an investable environment and that over the long term, not just the short term where we're getting lots of infusions of federal money and state money, but over the long term, this is a place that it's safe to invest in where that investment will return value. Right, right. Jerry, you guys have been in downtown Detroit for forever uh, uh, and are now starting to see some, some changes and take a more active role really in, in pushing that change, particularly in your, own, in your own neighborhood there. You know, as in my travels uh, to talk to investors, we routinely get asked questions about Detroit and the future of Detroit, usually in concerned tones. And uh, for the first time in a long time, I am able to give very tangible examples of how the city is moving. We see it because of the nature of our company. We end up, uh, because of gas and electric supply, involved in so many of the infrastructure projects that are moving. But I'll give you an example of one. I've, for years, I've grabbed a cup of coffee, looked out my window at a tundra of parking lots between the, uh, the stadiums in I-75 and our office complex with the new Red Wings arena coming in uh, by the Illich family investment. We are now scrambling to build electric infrastructure in the region around it because, as Rip said, there's a confidence being brought mm -hmm. uh, that the, the area is changing and new capital should follow it. And I really think it's gonna become an incredibly attractive area for new businesses and new residential development. And that residential development is, is key, Vishan. That's, that's the thing that we have not been able to move the needle on, it seems like, in Detroit. Well, I mean, the numbers are still tough for new residential development yeah. in Detroit. If you look at the numbers, you know, making the, uh, making the revenues work is very hard. But I think what we really need to do in terms of this is focus, I think the idea of bringing immigration into the city is terrific, but also focusing on, on these millennials. I mean, I was in Detroit uh, about six months ago and was toured around by a group of the young people there, and I was, just flabbergasted and amazed by the things they were doing. There's a maker culture, it's a very entrepreneurial culture, figuring out how to support them, even in small ways, whether it's bike lanes or just things that make that downtown more attractive is going to bring more residents, uh, uh, residential density into the heart of the city. Right. Uh, you were talking in your speech about this sort of prioritization um, of resources. When you look at a city like Detroit and sort of its relationship to, to Lansing, its relationship to Washington, what are the things that you see that still need to be adjusted to, to sort of uh, uh, be focused more on propping up cities like Detroit rather than uh, other areas? Well, look, there's a lot, these are local decisions, and there's a lot of great leadership sure. here, and I'm not going to fly in from New York and tell you how to allocate your budgets. But what I've noticed, and it's certainly been a, an issue in New York, and I think it's an issue in most major cities, is there's this fundamental tension between you know, having a well-paid, well-benefited uh, municipal workforce, and I used to work for Mayor Bloomberg, so I understand that, sure. right? Um, and and in ha having tax revenue left to invest in quality of life. And I think what our municipal workforce, it's very important for them to understand that it is to their benefit in the end for cities to be able to invest in quality of life uh, because that's what's gonna keep our tax base up and it's gonna keep pension plans secure and so forth. And, and so but they're striking, the right, striking the right balance and Dan Doctoroff, who again used to, you know, is from, from Detroit, speaks about this a lot, that he sees this as one of the biggest challenges in municipal governance today of how to actually balance those two pressures. Right. Well, you know, the, the starting point in, in many cities that have faced what Detroit does always looks daunting. So 
I was mentioning earlier that I, I lived and worked in Baltimore, worked in Pittsburgh, lived and worked in Cleveland, all at times when they were trying to fight their way from sure. a very tough beginning. And it looked tough at the outset. But what catalyzes it is strong political leadership that creates confidence in the business community to invest and residents, often young people first, who are willing to put their energy and their resources behind the redevelopment. And it always looks hard to make the equation foot, but when you get thousands of people uh, putting their energy, resources, and commitment behind it, uh, the, the equation changes. Right. And, and it, I think we're on the cusp of that. And it moves faster than, than yes. we tend to think it does. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, uh, Baltimore is a great example. I lived in Baltimore for a, a long time and uh, uh, saw how quickly uh, things change and how quickly they can matter, uh, the change can matter for, for people uh, all over a city. Yeah, go ahead, Jay. I was going to say, uh, just in continuing to build on the millennials, and uh, oh, the, com the uh, comment that really struck me was one uh, made the observation, listen, we have the opportunity, we can go anywhere we want to go, but I can go be a number in Chicago. Hmm. I can be a pioneer in Detroit. Right. And I can really define myself in Detroit. And that kind of energy is what absolutely what's needed. The other thing that I think we're seeing happen now, and we saw it on the floor of the House when we passed the package for the settlement, we had super majorities vote for each bill in that package. And what we saw was we saw legislators from Southwest Michigan, from Northern Michigan, standing up and saying, I stand with you. And we're in this together. And so even as we have this conversation about prioritization, I want to be sure that it's not the urban core versus mm -hmm. the suburbs. Right. This is us coming together. It's not West Michigan versus Southeast Michigan. We are all Michiganders, and we need to come together and make sure that we're all succeeding together. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Rip. You know, Stephen, one of the things that, though, that the speaker's comments make me think about is that it is hard, though, as a political matter for folks not from Detroit to sort of take a bet on Detroit in the abstract. And I think what's happened in the last four or five years is we actually have proof points, whether it's the rail project, whether it's Jerry's expansion, whether it's um, the, the new entrepreneurial energy in Midtown, whether it's the riverfront. I mean, there are a whole suite of things that I think give folks not just in Detroit hope, but folks outside of Detroit hope. And I think what's, what we're seeing is the sort of accelerator effect is that with each one of these success points, uh, I think people think, well, actually, we can crack this code. We actually can begin to layer. And when these things begin to combine and recombine, you get something quite extraordinary. Because Midtown is not just about new young people moving in. I mean, as extraordinary as that is, it's about long established neighborhoods coming back to life. It's right. about creating job centers for both local residents and folks who have never been to Detroit. I mean, it's all of those things sort of working in this sort of complex interplay. And I think, I, I don't mean to be presumptuous, but it just, if I were a legislator out state and I saw that happening in the midst of what everyone is telling us is one of the sort of the dark, you know, moments of any municipal history of a, of a bankruptcy, if you can make progress with that level of, of uh, certitude about sort of a positive future, I mean, you've really accomplished something quite extraordinary. And I'm hoping that that is a message that the rest of the state has picked up. Yeah. But when you talk about young people and you talk about entrepreneurs, I think that's one of the good things is to see the young people come back and reinvest into Detroit. Because so often what happens is our young people leave to they go leave. to college yeah. and they find no reason to come back to Detroit. And so what we're seeing now is the young people see a reason to come back to Detroit and they are coming back to Detroit. And I think that's a very good thing because we're going to need those young people <laughs> as we age. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to need those young people. You're not Detroit. aging, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I do want to ask you, uh, President Jones, about uh, that balance between uh, maintaining uh, uh, the municipal workforce at, at a sufficient level and delivering services. That, for us in Detroit, is, is a, a real sticking point. I mean, we've had endless, endless arguments, it seems, over uh, what some people would call is the union culture uh, that, that, that dominates uh, the municipal workforce. I, I would say it's you know standard of living, quality of life for them. 
that's at stake, uh, but that seems so much at odds sometimes with maintaining the quality of life for those of us who live in the city. I mean, you're the president of the city council now. How do you, how do you see that shaking out uh, going forward? Well, I think it's important to have municipal workforce there as well. As we see, seen, there's been some privatization, but there's still, we still have city employees. And I think that's going to be very important to maintain city employees as you look at the pension and as we move forward. Because those city employees, they, they add to right. the pension and their money goes towards the pension as well. But the one thing that is important to people in the city of Detroit, we know, is services. Yeah. And one of the things that council done along with the mayor was the first thing we did was make sure we had the lighting authority, right. new lighting authority. And so we're seeing new lighting out in the city. And then we move forward and we start looking at blight. And we looked at the land bank authority and we put a lot of homes into that land bank authority. And so we're making a lot of progress and there's municipal services and privatization that's working hand in hand together. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this is not a, 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 an issue or a problem that's unique to Detroit. I mean, we have cities all over the state that are uh, teetering on the brink of financial trouble or in financial trouble and they have the same that same tension, uh, what's, what's the answer? And should, how, how involved should Lansing be in, in solving that? Well, again, going back to we're all in this together and you watch in this package as this package moved through and we had Speaker Pro Tem Walsh and, and uh, Detroit Chair Tommy Stallworth and the legislature working very closely together. We've got a great working relationship with Mayor Duggan and Council President Jones. And that needs to be replicated all over the place. That, that kind of cooperation needs to be replicated all over the place. And we have to move past the city saying what's the state going to do and the state blaming the cities for what is happening and instead look at what's, gonna, what's it going to take for us to succeed. And I think there are many important lessons we need to learn from Detroit as Detroit was experiencing its problems. I think there were many poor decisions made that accelerated the downward spiral. Uh, but it's not to belabor that, it's to learn from that. It's not to point blame, it's to, to chart a path forward. And I think that's what we need to do here in Detroit and that's what we need to do all across the state of Michigan. As you look at a scant four years ago, this conference, uh, it was very dour. It was very down. Yeah, it was like, literally raining outside and it was raining inside <laughs> at these meetings. Uh, last year, there was a lot of optimism with, mixed with skepticism. Okay, we can see some things happening, but is it real? We've been down this road before. This year, what I've sensed is that sun is out literally and figuratively. People are seeing things happen, and that's what we need to, to continue to press forward all over the state. You know, the, uh, the, the question of unity, in division, we talked urban core, suburbs, east, west in politics. I've seen it in the business world. Uh, there was a time when the east side of the state and the west side of the state from a business interest standpoint were very divided. Separate organizations, separate agendas, often an agenda in the west that was averse to Detroit's agenda and so forth. That has evaporated. Uh, the business leaders decided a number of years back we're going to combine the eastern and western organizations into one organization, Business Leaders for Michigan. And when the uh, legislative package for, the, pack, for the, the overall deal in Detroit came before business leaders, it was ironclad unanimous support mm -hmm. from all businesses, including unanimous support from the west side. Mm -hmm. And that would not have existed a handful of years ago, and it, it really does talk to your point that I think people have realized that for this state to be healthy, it needs to be healthy in whole. And uh, so big movement in the business community as well as the political world. Absolutely. I know I shared with Mayor Duggan that uh, he was in a meeting in Grand Rapids talking to business leaders in Grand Rapids about the time I was walking the streets in Detroit with Harvey Santana. <laughs> and you know, who would have thought that that would happen, but that's what's necessary and that is what's happening here in Michigan. Right. And uh, I just want to add, ahead. when you talk about unity, the one great thing that you notice that's happening with us is the unity amongst council members and the unity amongst the mayor, and that has been a great thing. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask you about that. We've seen a really different relationship yeah. Uh, both between you and the mayor, uh, but also uh, between uh, you and I'm taking, talking about you and your position uh, and the rest of the council. Uh, things seem to, you know, everyone seems to be rowing in the same direction, uh, and that's that's new for us. Well, you know, thank you. Thank you. you know, I think 
we all realize that, again, we're here for one reason, and that is to move Detroit forward, that it's a new day. And the mayor and I have a great relationship, and I can say the mayor also have a great relationship with all of the council members. Yeah. And that's something that we haven't seen in the past, and that's something that we have strived for to make sure that we continue to have this great relationship so that we can continue to move the city and the state forward. Right. Stephen, can I just, um, can I sort of expand the circle? Sure. Because I think leadership matters hugely in all sectors of the community. I mean, I think the mayor and the council president have sort of modeled what it means to, to work cooperatively and constructively. But think about the role of the business community, whether it's Jerry's work, whether it's Dan Gilbert's work, whether it's Nancy Schlichting's work, whether it's Mayor Duggan's work when he was at, at the hospital. I mean, there's a huge coalition of business leaders who are stepping up. The philanthropic community, I think I saw Dave Egner in the community who's leading the New Economy Initiative. The Ford Foundation really doubling down in Detroit. I think the work that we've done at Kresge. The civic community that is sort of um, going neighborhood by neighborhood and removing blight and mentoring kids and doing all of the things that sort of add to a quality of life. This is an extraordinary time and I wouldn't, I think we would be remiss if we didn't put the, the, the media into that. You know, Stephen yesterday accepted his Pulitzer and I think, um, <laughs> apart from being a completely gratuitous comment, I wanted to, um, <laughs> I wanted to suggest that the media has had a huge role. I mean, the reason Stephen got his Pulitzer is he took a very courageous stand on the part of the newspaper very early on that set a tone about where this community needs to go and how it needs to get there. And so my sense is that what you have under the, you know, the leadership of the mayor and the council president is a community in which strength points all across the community are creating a very different kind of leadership model. And when I talk around the country, people look at Detroit and they're just in awe of the fact that these different sectors have come together, together with the state, together with the county and everybody else. But as a community, it's really an extraordinary accomplishment, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's very different. It feels different. Yeah, you know, I, I, I want to sort of pivot a little bit. Uh, uh, this is all, everything we're saying, uh, I think you can feel when you're in the city in terms of that momentum, in terms of the cooperation. But of course, it's still a city uh, with immense problems uh, and, and lots of spots that are just uh, depressing and, and uh, desperately need help. I'm wondering uh, what, what, What's the connection between this momentum and investment uh, and excitement and your average Detroiter who you know, lives on a block that maybe has five houses now and uh, maybe the street lights don't work and uh, are, are just coming back on? Uh, how, do we, how do we do more to, to, to translate the positive that we see uh, at this level down to, the, down to that street level? Well, I'll give you an example of one of those that's been talked about for decades, and Councilwoman mentioned it, Mayor talked about it the other day, and that's lighting. Lighting matters in the business district. It's an image issue. Sure. But in the neighborhoods, it's much more important than that. It's safety. A fundamental safety issue. And people have lived with it for a long, long time. When you have a whole array of issues and it appears dawning, sometimes the only way to go after them is to take them one by one and just knock them down. Uh, we're serving as a expert advisor to the lighting authority. We are, it's, you know, it's not our lighting system, but we are trying to help. I remember the first meeting with the mayor on lighting, soon after he was elected, asked if he could meet with some of our people. The blizzard of questions that came at us in detail <laughs> that were really good questions uh, stunned me. And I walked out of that meeting and said, I think we just got to ask more good questions in 45 minutes than we've had in years <laughs> on this system. The last question we got asked was, can you give me a daily report that tells me every day the progress we're making against this issue? Hmm. It's no mystery that we've gone from putting in 500 lights last year to 20,000 this year. Because he gets together with that team every week and wants a progress report on what we've knocked out and the neighborhoods, the vast majority of them, are going to be relit this year. And the whole city will be relit by next year. And it's the attention to detail and the tenacity of leadership and co cooperation with council that's creating that. And the neighborhoods will feel it. Now, there's going to be a lot left to do, but 
uh, I think if we can take our problems one by one and just knock them down, people will feel it and it'll help to create this, this pull for more people to add their, their energy and resources to the mix. Yeah. And I think, Stephen, because people are seeing the changes now, they're saying, when are you coming to my neighborhood? And because Detroit didn't get the way it is overnight. Right. Mm -hmm. It took many years for Detroit to get into the situation that it is, is in right now. So people are saying, we saw what happened in the um, neighborhood that we were in, in Morningside and over there, right. where there were houses that were auctioning. They're saying, when are you coming to my neighborhood? You went to Boston Edison. You went to Osborne. When are you coming to my neighborhood? So they're seeing the changes in the neighborhoods. And so what we're saying is, Let's take neighborhood at a time, one neighborhood at a time, and we'll get around the whole city. And eventually you will see the change in the whole city. It's coming and it, it's gonna change faster than it changed to where we got where we are today. Right. So I'm telling people, hold on. Don't sell your house, because if you sell your house, you're not gonna, gonna be able it. to buy enough <laughs> but at the same price you're there That's now. Right. That's right. You know, and I think we're hitting on the fact that it's gotta be results for the residents of Detroit. Yeah, uh, right. When you drive through Detroit, there are those who say, look how great the city was. Uh, I think we need to look and say, look how great the city it can is. be. Mm -hmm. And when I went with Harvey Santana and went into his community, talked to neighbors, we literally stopped on the street. People had no idea we were coming and talked to them about what do you wanna see, what do you need to see? And it was, listen, I don't care who gets it done. I just want to see it done. I want to see my neighborhood taken care of. My kids walk to school, be a safe one, have the street lights on. And Harvey took, to, took me to River, Rouge Park and said, listen, help me with a pool here at Rouge Park so that kids can be playing in the pool in the dog days, days of summer instead of getting into trouble. It's maybe little things like that, but things that can turn around that neighborhood, turn around that community. And, and that's when it became very clear to me, it's not about what advantages or disadvantages a municipality might have, what legislation goes in place, it's what actually impacts the lives of the people that live in that community. Yeah, I'm right. just struck by the commonality with where New York was in the late 70s, mm -hmm. the fact that the business community and the political community did come together, there was unity. Uh, and that the average New Yorker suddenly started seeing changes. I mean, it was extraordinary. You couldn't walk down the street without getting mugged at a certain moment, right? And that same city today, we've in, I mean, it's just in terms of the lesson of patience, between 2000 and 2010, the number of toddlers living in New York City has increased by 40%. Um, you know, we can't, but, but the one thing I would say about that lesson is that we are not the city we were when the problems began. And Detroit will look different than what it used to look like when it was in its heyday. Mm -hmm. So for instance, we used to be a hub and spoke city. Everyone came into basically one part of town to right. work right. And, and then went, went home. You look at that same city today, there are people who live in Brooklyn, work in Brooklyn, and go to Midtown Manhattan once every year. Uh, and so this city will be a very different city than what it was when it was successful in its rebirth. And right. I think that's, to me, for the average resident, there, there should be something uh, encouraging and exciting about that yeah, uh, yeah. because it, it's up to them to build. Yeah. What, what about schools? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, people say to me all the time, you're not going to solve the city's problems unless you solve the school problems. Families won't live here uh, unless they can send their kids to school. But, but then I think of cities like New York and Chicago, uh, Los Angeles, those cities have not solved the school problem. Uh, they have good schools within them, but um, you know, they, they, have, they have immense problems as well. How do, how do we address that, Vishan? Well, I, I just say a couple of things. New York City schools have improved quite a bit, public schools. Sure. I would say, again, going, so this is a, maybe slightly older than millennials, but young people, when they move to a neighborhood and the neighborhood becomes more mixed income, tends to put pressure on the public school system to get better. And that's something that uh, I think at a local level is extremely important is that kind of parent involvement. But the other thing I would just say, and I think it's a huge competitive advantage for Detroit right now, is cities like New York and San Francisco have become extremely expensive for young families. Sure. So by the time the second kid mm -hmm. comes along, <laughs> right, What's, what's interesting is that family isn't moving to the suburbs of Jersey. They're looking for other cities to move to. They're looking to St. Louis, and, 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 and Detroit could and should be on that could list. And so to me, you're absolutely right to focus on this. If you can get even a few great schools 
happening in the, in the heart of the downtown. That's going to be not just a, a great blessing for the people who live near those schools, it's going to be a magnet for people who are looking for cheap places to live where they can still give their kids a good education. Yeah, yeah. I, I, just, I also think that schools, like every other element of civic life, don't exist in isolation. And as we build neighborhoods around them, as we build transit to and from them, as mm -hmm. we surround them with the kind of support services that make families able to navigate their life circumstance better, it all helps. And so I think even as we sort of knock down problems one by one, one of the advantages Detroit has coming out of a, a bankruptcy is it actually has a framework. And you know, a year ago when we were at Mackinac, the Detroit Future City Plan was sort of this sort of lofty, big idea. It wasn't quite sure how it would work. We now have a staff of 15 people led by former Council President Cockrell. We've got a budget that is sort of driving change in neighborhood. And I think things like the Blight Task Force are very hard to understand in the absence of that frame because 80,000 blighted homes, all of this abandoned property, where do you move first, where do you move sixth? I think things like the Detroit Future City Plan help create a sort of a sense of order, sequence, and pacing for the change. And so I can imagine that the schools will never fully get cracked. It's just too hard. But at some point, I think that just like the rest of the quality of life in the city, the schools are going to improve as the community improves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I agree. And I think also that we all need to look at the schools, and we all need to play our role in the schools as well. Also, often we just wait on the parents to play a role in the school, but I think it's important that everyone plays a role in the school. And one of the things that I'm going to do is start the co-op program back with the schools. You know how at one point, and I graduated from Cass Tech, right. at one point you had the co-op where you worked during the day, you right. might have went to school first hour through fourth hour, and then you worked fourth hour to ninth hour, and DTE has said that they will be joining me with the co-op programs as well as other companies. And I'm saying to anyone, you don't have to take 10 students. You can take two students. But I'm asking everyone to get involved so that our children will know what it's like to get into the corporate world once they graduate from school. So that is one thing I'm taking up under my umbrella and will be working to go into the schools, not just Detroit public schools, but all of the school systems to get them involved into the workforce. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a great point, and we, we are excited to join you on that. There's been a lot of asks uh, as to how business can help. This is one of the most obvious ways, is to help provide jobs for young people. The mayor called upon us the other day, 5,000 jobs. That is extremely doable. <laughs> uh, we have 500 kids that we're employing this summer, high school kids. I can tell you it's, it's not overly expensive to employ high school kids in these jobs around the city, but it's a fantastic experience for them. Uh, Co-ops, interns, business can do that, and it's, it's a great thing for us to, make, to move along. Uh, Richon, I'm, I'm wondering what you think about the idea of uh, of regionalism. It's something that's a word we use around here a lot, and uh, I think a lot of times people say that and are not quite sure what that means. Uh, but I was struck in your speech by this sort of dichotomy between uh, the urban core and the suburbs. Uh, what relationship should exist uh, between those two? It, it, th this is a very tough issue, I think, for our country because the Constitution actually doesn't exactly help us in terms of the way our population is represented. So if you look at the United States today, about 70% of our population lives in what we call seven or eight large regions around the country. And this isn't just the Northeast. This is all over. Everywhere. And uh, my, like my favorite one is the Charlanta Corridor, right? right? <laughs> so let's take the Charlanta Corridor. There's no regional governance that can advocate at the federal level for what that corridor needs, right? right? And so you, you, if you take a place like New York, we, yes, we are a unified New York state, but the, the cities across the Hudson River, Hoboken, Jersey City, we have much more common cause with them in terms of our daily economy than we do with cities today in way in upstate New York. Right. Mm -hmm. And yet we have no ability to sort of plan for transportation, for infrastructure, for a whole variety of things. And in fact, the history of these things has been that we've competed with each other. Right. 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 And, and that is actually not, that, that is a, for us, in my mind, a disservice to our global competitiveness. Because globally, 
regions are figuring out how to work together and actually sort of orchestrate their economies and their infrastructure systems, their school systems and so forth. This is something we need to tackle as a nation is understanding how to make our regions work together. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that's, that's uh, a potential uh, uh, issue for us in Lansing, right? I mean, we've got hyper, hyper local government structure in this state where, uh, you know, hundreds of municipalities within a very small uh, uh, area, hundreds of school districts uh, within a very small area. Is it time for us to, to revisit that? At the well, state? whether you, you do it through structure or you do it effectively, um, I think are two different questions. And I think there's great resistance to doing it through structure. Everybody thinks we ought to have fewer schools, but not fewer my schools. Not, not my uh, schools. And right. don't, don't mess with my mascot, the guy right. from Marshall says. <laughs> right. uh, don't mess with the football <laughs> team's mascot. Uh, the, the point is, though, you don't have to eliminate the, the structural boundaries, you, but you have to eliminate the structural divisions. Right. And uh, we need to recognize that we are, it is us against the world, uh, in that it's Michigan, it does compete globally. And so as someone who travels globally, it has the opportunity to do so. You know that when you say you're from Michigan, you're asked about Detroit. And so it makes no sense for me to sit in Marshall and ignore what happens in Detroit. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to understand that we've got to be in this together to the point that what happens in Detroit does impact jobs and opportunities in Marshall. And then that flips the other way, that what happens in West Michigan does impact. So uh, that we do get the question, listen, are you gonna shred up and, and uh, remove townships or are you gonna eliminate cities, force consolidation, mm -hmm. eliminate school districts? Uh, that is an interesting debate. I don't see that happening. I also don't think that that's necessary to garner the kind of cooperation we need. And again, we just saw it in the House when we saw supermajorities vote for this package. And repeatedly, legislators say, I'm elected by a district, but I'm obligated to govern for the full state. That's the attitude we need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Stephen, no Mackinac conference would be complete without telling you that the rail project is about to break ground. It's going to break ground. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think this is the fourth conference I've said that at. Um, but this time actually is true. And, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, but I, I think to, to the speaker's point, I mean, it, 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 you, this is really one where you got to knock them down one at a time. Because if we can create the rail line that becomes sort of the spine for the regional system, we can get the RTA up and going, we can um, begin doing the bus rapid transit that the governor has advocated. We've got all the legislation in place. I mean, another remarkable act set of actions from the legislature. I think it begins to sort of stitch the, the region together. I mean, I think the art millages began to sti uh, stitch the region together. And I think you can kind of move these issues one at a time and, and show that, in fact, there is this sort of interconnected destiny. And in fact, the functionality of the region improves by the fact that we are more closely connected. If I, can I amend my comments, too, to talk about quite often we look so globally, and I made most of my comments about globally, but what we need to have are pocket, pockets of success, whether it's within the neighborhoods of Detroit that grow and then stitch together, kind of to build on what you were saying, Rip, that we talk globally, but we need, and we talk about regions, but we need those individual successes, those individual school buildings that, that branch out then into individual neighborhoods, and then those neighborhoods run together, and then those communities run together, then the region runs together. So I think it has to be a bottom up more than a top down. Yep, I agree with that. By the way, on the, on the rail line in the Regional Transit Authority, uh, when you talked about it four years ago, yeah. we were doing nothing. Yeah. Uh, this year when you're talking about it, we're tearing up Woodward Avenue and realigning electric infrastructure to make way for it. So I sure hope it's coming because yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. we're doing a lot of work. Spending money on Stephen it. was asking me outside. He said, well, you know, you're tearing up the road. Is that rail or is that something else? And I said, from here on out, everything is the rail project. Everything is rail. <laughs> right. We can claim credit for it one way or another. Yeah. And I have to agree. I think transportation is going to be a very important yeah. thing in this. And as you go to all of the other urban cities, one of the things that you can do is move around because of the transportation. Yeah. The rail mm -hmm. in Detroit is going to be a start. And hopefully, mm -hmm. we can get it across 8 Mile and yeah. we can join and we can continue to have a great rail system throughout the city. We can one day say we can take the rail system to the airport. That would be a great thing. And so I think transportation is one of the great things that is going to bring the region together and it's going to tie in. We need transportation to be able to get around Detroit to the next city. To the, right, the to other the next places. City. This is, amen. <laughs> uh, you know, the, 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 this is, I think, one of the places we've fallen the most behind the rest of the industrialized world. Uh, yeah. 
right? Uh, we have, in New York City, we have 36 flights a day that fly from New York to Philadelphia. It is utter madness. <laughs> uh, you know, our, we, we simply are not, urban mobility is what gives people job access, school access, for, and, and it should be a bipartisan issue. There's nothing partisan about the idea that Americans deserve great infrastructure. We have the money to pull this off. And it's interesting, when I talked about the high-speed rail, national high-speed rail in this country that would connect up all of our regions would probably has a price tag of about $200 billion. So that's about a third of the stimulus package that yeah. President Obama passed when he first came into office. And if you, if, if you went to the average American and said, would that be a good investment for our country, a third of that stimulus package, I think most Americans would say, on either side of the aisle, red state, blue state, would say that is a really good idea in terms of employing people and moving people around in the right kind of way across our cities and regions. We, we have to fix this problem. So it's great to hear that it's happening in Detroit, but we have to fix this problem. Yeah, yeah. And yet, Mr. Speaker, we're still fighting over road funding. And yeah, I, I agreed to be on this panel because I didn't think we were going to talk about roads. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no such luck. <laughs> I haven't been able to escape it anywhere. Uh, infrastructure is a very important, very proper role of government. It is a very important need for our communities to succeed. And so well, that's why we are tackling the issue in the legislature now. I hope it yeah. goes on the list of things that we inherited that was decades old that we checked off and provided solutions for our residents. Yeah, and even though you and I might get into it over some stuff, we, we actually agree on roads, and you've shown, you've shown real leadership on that. I mean, well, One of the really interesting forward. parts about the post-bankruptcy Detroit is that I think it helps us also to think about public infrastructure differently. Jerry is involved in public infrastructure. We're involved in public infrastructure. We're taking to our board next week an additional infusion of money for the rail project. Uh, the river walk is public infrastructure. I mean, a lot of folks have their hands in public infrastructure. What Dan Gilbert is doing downtown and creating the kind of the connective tissue among his buildings is public infrastructure. And so I think in many ways, Detroit can actually be out ahead of the rest of the, the nation in some of these issues mm -hmm. because we're really pulling the entire civic community together to define how we create, maintain, and improve public infrastructure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's going to be about all the time we have. I want to thank the panel and Vishan especially for your speech. Sure. Okay. Uh, great, great panel. Thanks, everybody. Um, you know, we had a lot of great discussion over the last three days, a lot, a lot of thought-provoking discussion such as this panel brought us. Uh, the uh, conference is now over, but now it's time to move from discussion into action. So let's, let's move along and, and get that done. Thanks, everybody. Have a safe trip home.